Um, I'm going to just turn it over to Jeff um, and let him talk about his experience, uh, his company, uh, and the things that he's, uh, he's done to vision the future and, and creating it. So, Jeff. Thank you. Well, good afternoon again. Uh, interesting thing is I'm actually kind of transitioning in my uh, employment right now, and we're going to talk about that a little bit uh, as we get into the presentation. Um, but uh, right now I'm currently residing in uh, Cape Coral, Florida. I moved down there in 2005 from Michigan. I uh, was working for a firm up here, went to work for a firm down there, uh, kind of started a, another firm down there, and now I'm actually in the process of, of moving once more. So uh, we'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, my LTU experience. Uh, this is probably one of the uh, happiest days I had um, because I got through four years here at Lawrence Tech. And as you guys probably know, uh, it's not the easiest place to get through four years. But when you come out of here, uh, you've got one hell of an education. Uh, my buddy Derek is actually sitting in here today. He works uh, not far down the road, and that's him in the picture next to me. And uh, we were younger, we had more hair. Well, you still have hair, but some of us uh, don't have hair anymore. Uh, you know, what was important to me uh, was I, I knew I wanted to come uh, to Lawrence Tech sometime in high school. And um, I had made some campus visits. I had decided I wanted to get into civil engineering. Um, and one of the, the hurdles that I had was a financial hurdle. And uh, I owe a lot to Lawrence Tech because uh, I, I, got, I applied, I was accepted, uh, I applied for a scholarship. And uh, is Dr. Chris still here? Is he still teaching? Awesome. Um, Dr. Chris, some of us started calling him Dr. Christ because he was the uh, head of the scholarship committee. And my dad and I came here around this time in 1996. Um, we, we were touring the campus and we asked about the scholarships and they said, Dr. go see Dr. Chris. And he was just getting out of class. And, and so we introduced ourselves and, and uh, we asked about the scholarships. He said, well, it's kind of funny. We just had our um, first meeting last night to award the first set of scholarships. He pulls out this thing. He's looking through, and he looks up, and he says, congratulations. We're all going to be offering you a full tuition scholarship. And uh, my mouth about hit the floor. My dad fell into a chair in Dr. Chris's office because he couldn't believe it. Um, he was a Detroit cop for 30 years, and my mom didn't work. So uh, I was, that was my biggest concern was financial. And, I owe a lot to Lawrence Tech in, in granting me that scholarship because it really set into motion pretty much my life from that point on and, until now. Um, so I really, really appreciate uh, what they did. And certainly uh, Dr. Carpenter here from the Civil Department, um, funny story about him, I was in his first class here at Lawrence Tech. And I remember we got our schedules and saw Carpenter. Who's this Carpenter guy? We marched down to Dr. Prezoon's office. We said, Who's, we're supposed to have Dr. Ewan. You know, we're seniors. You can't do this to us. You can't throw us some new guy. And he said, look, just give him a chance. Give him a chance. I, I think you guys are going to like him. And uh, so we, hydraulic engineering uh, was the class. We went through the semester. And at the end of the time, we marched down to Dr. Prezoon's office. And we apologized to him and <laughs> said, you were right. Uh, he's a keeper. So you know, do what you can to keep him around, because he was, uh, it was a great time. Um, so. What I learned to survive college, I want to start out with some tips since you guys are in it right now, some things that really helped me. Core group of friends, you know, Derek's here. Uh, Derek, Mike, and Olivia, we were kind of the core group for a while. Um, we tried to schedule all our classes together. I can't stress to you enough, I know how Lawrence Tech is, is usually known as a commuter school. Um, but the, you know, grabbing that core group and getting in here, finding the people who are in the trenches with you, in the, in the classes with you, um, who understand what you're going through. And you know, when you get out of Calc 2 and you go, what the hell is he talking about today? Usually one of somebody else in the group understood it and could put it into English so that you can understand it. So core group of friends, very important. Don't be somebody who just drives here to campus, takes your classes, and drives home. Um, I can tell you from life experiences that is not going to help you, and we'll talk of some more reasons why. But just get that core group that you really can count on, study together, have fun together, all that good stuff. Um, trying to avoid all-nighters. Uh, as you get older, I can tell you they're a lot harder. But uh, anything you can do, you're going to have some. It's going to happen. It's inevitable. But try to avoid them. Uh, asking for help. The biggest thing that, you know, not just from your friends, but your professors, some of you may find it hard to believe, but your professors are not actually here to fail you. 
They want to see you be successful. And they constantly are telling you, you know, if you don't understand something, talk to me after class. Come to my office hours. I think you guys still have the tutoring center. Is that still going on here? So, you know, spend some time there. Just always never be afraid to ask for help. Because we all know that in engineering school, on day one, we, you know, we learn this. And then on day two, it goes to this. And, you know, holy cow, that escalated quickly. Um, and that's kind of, I think, I think Derek can attest to it. You know, you come in, you're like, all right, I'm all ready to go. We start off with some easy stuff, and then the next day it's like, oh my God, what have I done? Uh, so asking for help, very key. Uh, the other thing is that sometimes you just need a break. And I, you know, you gotta have fun with what you're doing. You gotta be able to blow off steam. Um, as far as anybody's concerned, everybody in this picture is over the age of 21, right? Um, but you, you know, like I said, the core group of friends. You're, you're in the trenches together, you're studying together, you gotta go out and sometimes have a drink together blow off some steam and, and just just relax. Um, engineering school, architecture school, it's hard enough. Uh, so you know, find some time to blow off some steam. So what LTU taught me, number one, being a lifelong learner. So key, so key. Regardless, I, from all the different um, areas, degree areas I heard you guys in, you're always gonna be learning something. One of the things I like most about engineering is that I learn something new just about every day. I have a new challenge to face every day. I have something new I have to figure out every day. So, uh, and, and a lot of the professors are very good about telling you, look, we're teaching you some theory, and we're teaching you some basics, but we're also trying to teach you how to teach yourselves, how to be interested in, in the, the new uh, technology that's coming out or new methods of designing something. Uh, because, you know, as, as good as the professors here are, you know, things are always changing in the real world. We're always learning new things. There's always new technologies coming out. So being a lifelong learner, having that, that want to go out and uh, just find new things, figure out better ways of doing things. Think, innovate, and solve. Uh, you know, engineers, problem solvers, architects, problem solvers, uh, our lives are all about solving problems, trying to make things better. And one of the things that Lawrence Tech really instilled in me was Thinking, taking a different look at things, um, trying to think of those different ways of doing it, questioning things, you know, we've done it this way for 50 years, why? Why have we done it this way for 50 years? And can we do it better? Is there a better way to do it? Do we really need to do it the way we've been doing it for 50 years? How to be a team player. Uh, I think you guys are probably finding this out. It kind of goes back to the same thing, core group of friends. Um, we do so much stuff collaboratively now uh, as, as engineers, as architects, scientists, everybody. We're all working in teams. We're all working together. And really what you got to pretend is everyone in this room is, uh, we all work for the same company. Um, we may not all like each other. We may not all get along. But at the end of the day, we have to all work together and create a product for our client or create a design for our client. We have to try not to you know, have a building fall down and kill people. I mean, it's, it's stuff like that. And you really have to you know, build that trust and know that I may not go out and drink with you after work, but I have to be able to work with you in the office. Um, team player, it, it's key, especially now. And then, of course, professional organizations and networking. You know, Lawrence Tech has always had a great group of organizations for you to join and get involved with. And it is never, ever too early to get involved in those organizations. Um, and you, know, you may have guest speakers. Um, you may go on field trips. Any chance you get to get out and see things, talk to people, get business cards from people. Um, make those, those personal interactions can be so important because you can then be going for a job a couple years from now. And maybe the person you're trying to get a job from came in and spoke to you. And now you have that little bit of a personal connection. Hey, I remember you, know, you came to Lawrence Tech and you gave this great presentation. It was about such and such, and I was, you know, I really found it interesting. Well, all of a sudden you've got a leg up on somebody who's just, you know, sending in their resume who doesn't have that personal connection. So, networking, always be networking. One of the other things that that I learned from Lawrence Tech and my involvement with professional organizations was giving back to the community. Um, I'm involved in a lot of different things, from you know, planning its own commission to uh, Science Center Board of Directors, uh, Transportation Planning Organization, um, and then also things like this, which are in Florida, we've started uh, in, in Lee County, a STEM at Work program. And what we're trying to do is get high school students out to companies and job sites and get them exposed to what we really do as engineers. Uh, I was just reading an article this morning that 
STEM fields, you guys all know what STEM fields are, right? Science, technology, engineering, and math. Okay. Um, job growth in STEM fields is outpacing all other areas of the economy three times to one. So jobs in STEM fields growing three times the rate as anything else in our economy. Yet we have less students graduating with engineering degrees, less students graduating with STEM degrees. So at some point, uh, we're all going to be making a lot of money because there's not going to be a lot of people around to do what we know how to do. Um, but there's going to be this, this need for more people. So one of my passions is STEM education and getting involved and getting kids involved from different ages. I mean, on the left there, those are middle school students racing uh, Lego cars down the street, uh, the string. And not only do they have to be the first one down to the end, but when their car hits that back of that chair, it can't break, otherwise they lose. Um, we had them floating uh, balloons in the air in a contest to see who could get their balloon to float, like in the middle of the room without touching anything for as long as possible. And just getting them to understand that the different forces at play there. Um, and then on the right, you know, I'm standing on a control structure at a job site that I designed and got high school kids out there and I'm explaining to them why we did rain gardens on the one side, how it goes through the control structure, treats the water, makes it nice and clean when it gets out to the lake. So I learned a lot of that at Lawrence Tech. We had a lot of opportunities to give back to the community and I encourage you guys to get out and do that as well. It's a great, time, great, great opportunity to meet people and get involved, give back, um, and, uh, and just really make an impact. And of course what LTU taught me is that sometimes you uh, just need a break. Um, this is a group of my friends from my MBA class. Uh, I finished an MBA in, in May from the University of Florida. Um, and as part of our program, we had to do a one-week international experience, international business experience. So we are in Prague, Czech Republic. It just so happened that the International Beer Fest was going on while we were there. Uh, so we had some time one day. We jumped on the uh, subway and ran out to the Beer Fest and ordered the sampler. And in Prague, uh, that's what they consider the sampler to be. There was uh, <laughs> 10 different kinds of beer. And of course, all the locals are laughing at us because they you know we're Americans. And they're like, oh yeah, like, let's watch these six guys go through this beer. And I'm happy to say we put them all down and uh, showed the uh, people of the Czech Republic that Americans can drink too. Um, but you know, having fun. You gotta, like I said, you got to get out and have some fun. So what happens when you don't have vision? Well, Keyshawn's going to help us out here with some come on man moments of engineering of what happens when you don't have vision. So here's the first thing. Um, civil students have probably seen this one. Uh, hopefully they give a hummer with the house because this is just not, um, not a good situation. This is when you don't have the vision of what the client wanted. Uh, number two, yeah, this is China where they decided to, I guess, not use geotechnical engineers. And uh, they decided that it would be good to take that mucky soil from the riverbank and use it as fill and put a, what, 12-story building on top of it? Now, the architects and structural engineers did a great job. I mean, that building fell over. It's still together. The problem is it fell over. I had a student in Florida ask me if they just picked the building up. And I said, well, it's China. Who knows? Yeah. They may have. Um, definitely not what you wanted. And then our final one here. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you're screwed at this point. Uh, this is called blow up both ends of the bridge and start over because there's no fixing this. Um, so these are the kinds of things that happen when we don't exactly have uh, the client's vision down pat or maybe we uh, didn't do so well in Calc 2 or something of that nature. So um, first thing I want to talk about, creating vision for uh, clients and projects. And what I want to start off with are keys to success that I've found and then I'll give you some, some actual project examples. So number one, listening. I cannot stress this enough. Listening to your client. Listening to what they want. Uh, you know, you guys are going to come out of here with your degrees and you're going to, I know everything, I'm ready to go, let me sit down, let me start designing something. Uh, and the first time you don't listen to the client and you end up with a bridge that doesn't line up, it's not a good situation. So I can't, you know, listening, listening, listening. It's all about what do they want and how are you going to deliver it to them? You know the design. You know, you know there's a thousand ways to, to do something. But what is the one way that they really want you to do it? What do they have in mind? What are they really looking for? Collaboration. Uh, another theme that you'll hear a lot. I thought, you know, talk teamwork, core group of friends. But really, you're going to have a lot of collaborating. 
Um, I work hand in hand with architects, landscape architects, planners, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, structural engineers, plumbing engineers, uh, developers, real estate agents, I mean anything you can think of. The, uh, these are all different people that I'm working with and on some projects I work with all of them on the same project. So collaboration is going to be key. Keeping an open mind. Um, like I said, a thousand ways to solve something. You may think it needs to be done one way, client wants it done another way. Have that, keep that open mind. You've got to stay, uh, I guess humble is the right word here, but you know, always be considering what do they want. It's not necessarily what you want. And also don't accept no. As I said, we've seen things designed a certain way. Do we have to continue to design them that way? No, we don't have to. If there's a better way, let's find it. If there's a way that's going to save the client money, absolutely. Uh, you know, in Florida, we, we do like these grass rain or uh, dry detention areas. And they're just flat bottom areas. The water goes in them and it you know, provides some stormwater treatment and the water kind of gets clean and, and goes out. Uh, we came up with a rain garden concept where we needed less fill, we put more plants in there that uh, treated the water even better. Um, so we had all these, these really good reasons, but financial reason came down to be the number one uh, benefit that the client was interested in as a developer. We were able on one project, a pretty large commercial project, to save the developer a couple hundred thousand dollars in fill dirt because of the way that we designed the rain gardens. He had to spend a little bit extra in plant material, uh, but we got more, cleaner water going out and uh, something that didn't look like a mud pit during the dry season, because in Florida we have rain uh, from like May till November, it rains about 50 to 60 inches, and then the rest of the year we hardly have any rain. And so these detention areas, they just they look terrible. Um, and so we said, well, we can give you something that is, is aesthetically pleasing, it cleans the water better, and we're actually going to save you money. And he said, sign me up. What, you, you, you had me at saves me money, but I'm glad you have some other benefits in there too. So, you know, it's okay to think through things and brainstorm things and come up with new ideas and present them to your client. Um, that's what they're paying you for. They, they're, you're the expert. So they're coming in, sitting down, and they're saying, okay, Mr. Engineer, Mr. Architect, uh, what do you got for me? What can we do? And then, of course, thinking big. Um, from buildings to sites to whatever, uh, just if you can dream it, we can probably do it. I mean, we've seen that especially in probably the last 10 years, that we can, I mean, we can do a lot of stuff that we never thought we could do. So never um, forget about thinking big. And then finally, you have to deliver. And that's the most important part, obviously, because we know that it's so hard to get a job, and we have to do the job and do the work and make the client happy. We've got to deliver his vision at the end and so that he'll come back to us and hire us for the next job. I mean, that's what it's all about. So t speaking of vision, this is, uh, anybody have any idea what this might be? Solar, solar, solar field, right. This is uh, Florida Gulf Coast University in Fort Myers, um, one of the first uh, uni public universities in the country to have its own solar field. I was fortunate to be the um, civil engineer on it. And uh, we had to deal with the issue of water and electricity don't mix real well, and we get all this rain, and we have uh, runoff, and what do we do with the runoff? Uh, and we had to think through all these ideas. We had to think through what do we want under these panels? Do we want vegetation that maybe doesn't have to be maintained or vegetation that does have to be maintained? Uh, we ended up going with uh, stone, uh, just like a, a stone um, uh, rock, just because when we dug out the stormwater lakes, we found actually large chunks of rock in there that they were able to crush down and spread out under the solar panels. And now we didn't have to worry about vegetation or maintaining vegetation. We were able to get water to, to perk through it. And we didn't actually need as big of lakes. So um, this was the vision that the client had. Uh, we were working in, you know, there's some wetlands in there. And, and we did all the work in the uplands. Uh, and this is, you know, what it looks like when it's done. It looks pretty close. I think we were short on some of the areas of panels just because there was some concern about hurricanes blowing over trees, landing on the panels and busting the panels. You know, we kind of have... Uh, big storms in Florida sometimes. Um, but, I mean, it, it really came to fruition. I mean, that's from uh, rendering to actual aerial photo. Um, another one, this was a project I worked on in Fort Myers. This is a, uh, about an 800-acre mixed-use development known as the Forum. 
And uh, I'm going to put up a picture that kind of focuses on uh, that retail development there. It's actually where we had the, the control structure I showed you earlier. But this was a client's vision where he came in. He, this is actually uh, Coach Pat Riley uh, is the money behind this project, and uh, which is why everything's Champion Ring Road and the Forum and Dynasty Drive and, and all that good stuff. Um, but he's, he said, I want to do something that Fort Myers uh, doesn't uh, have right now. Uh, you know, they don't have a lot of mixed use. They're doing all these golf course communities and all this commercial space. But um, I want to give them something where they can live and work and play all in, in one area. And so we kind of came up with this, this master plan. We had to work around some, uh, uh, some uh, environmentally sensitive areas and stuff. But we've got apartments. We've got condos. We have single family homes. Uh, we've got retail. We've got office. Uh, there's a YMCA in there. We've got uh, some hotels. So just, you know, a uh, good mix of things. And, you know, this is an aerial photograph during construction of the commercial area. we got a Home Depot and um, a Super Target. Now, the client, when he first started this project, actually wanted to fill a large portion of that lake. And uh, we would have we had an easier time fitting in all the buildings that he needed to make his pro forma work, so his financials work, so that it showed a viable project. Um, the problem was, by the time we got around to doing a cost estimate on the preliminary design, fill dirt, which normally goes for in Florida about three to five bucks a yard, was up to like $25 a yard. And it was going to take, I think, something like $20 million of dirt to fill in that lake. And he went, okay, no, no, no. That's good. I mean, that completely blows my performance out of the water. The, the project's not viable. Let's go back to the drawing board. Let's just kind of maybe straighten out the lake edge a little bit, do a little bit of fill. Um, but how can you still squeeze in all the buildings and all the parking and everything else that I need? And I, I kid you not, we did probably 30 site plans for this guy and tried to get his vision until it came to that one right there. And we went out, we designed it, we built it. And he was really, really happy and uh, went on to do some additional projects with him because of that. And then I wanted to do a little bit of a case study on a project that I, we just finished recently called Wild Turkey Strand. This is uh, in Lee County, they have a program called Conservation 2020, where the county has been collecting tax dollars, putting them into an account where they buy up uh, land, different uh, pieces of land around the county that are, uh, maybe have environmental qualities to them that, that they want to preserve. It really created like a, um, an urban, uh, urban rural kind of boundary around Lee County so that the growth didn't just get all crazy and sprawl all out. But in this case, the county came to us and they said, you know, we want to do something different here. We want public access to these ecosystems so they can get out and see it. But, you know, we're kind of wondering, up until this point, we've been using concrete and, and asphalt and um, is there other materials that we could use? We're really interested in, is there something that's a recyclable material that uh, is non-flammable so that if we have brush fires it doesn't melt or, or light up on fire? Um, is it, can we get something that's maybe pervious, lets the water through it? Um, is, is structurally sound, is low maintenance, uh, I'm trying to think of all the things. And we basically said, okay, well, you've issued us a challenge. Now let's go out and see if we can find something that works. And we marched through all kinds of different suppliers through our office. We had lunch and learns where they provided lunch and we learned about their product. And we drilled them with questions. We eventually came up with a matrix of all the products, all of the um, items that the county wanted, and then we used like green and red and maybe a, a yellow if it was questionable. But green meant that that, that product met that criteria, red meant it didn't. Um, and we came up with one product called FlexiPave that uh, was made out of 50% out of recycled tires. So you're taking, you know, at the end of every project, they give you a little sheet that says how many tires were actually saved from a landfill that they used in the, in the product. Uh, and I think for this product, we were something like 1,500 tires because of all the pathways and the parking areas that we use the product on. Um, the dry vial is asphalt there, but all of the parking and the pathways that you see is all the flexi paved material. So it's recycled tires mixed with the same uh, stone that you would mix into asphalt to make the asphalt solid. And we came up with it. The county has loved it. Now they want to do additional projects using flexi pave. 
because what it allowed us to do is you can build FlexiPave with only a foot. You only need a foot on either side of it to construct it. It's, it's really, it's done a lot with uh, guys and wheelbarrows and you don't need all kinds of machinery. But what the county liked was we can snake this pathway through all of our different uh, ecological areas without needing to clear a 30 foot wide path and all that additional cost. So the FlexiPave material is more expensive than just doing an asphalt path but we showed the county how much money they could save because now we didn't have to clear 30 feet, we didn't have to build detention swales, we didn't have to put pipes in the ground. The water got treated, the, the water management district that we have to permit through was happy with it, client was happy. I mean, they love this project. They're showcasing this project now as look at what we can do when we think about how to be innovative and creative and uh, think about the environment as well and we save taxpayer dollars. I mean, it was a win, 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 win. Um, and this is just another shot. We used uh, Trex boardwalks um, because of low flammability, again, for the brush fires and also recycled materials in the Trex. It's like a, kind of like a plastic product. It's not wood. Um, but we you know, we, we're snaking these, the trails through wild turkey strands. So, I mean, that's, I show you that because we listened to the client. We listened to what they wanted. We came up with some innovative solutions. We, we showed them the solutions, we convinced them that this is what to do, we designed it, we delivered it, they loved it, and now they want to do more with it. And now who are they going to turn to the next time they want to do a Conservation 2020 project? The firm that came up with this in the first place. So we've built that relationship, we've built that trust, and now maybe we don't have to fight with anybody else um, for that work in the future. I think that's a pretty good deal on uh, from the standpoint of the uh, as a consultant because anytime you don't have to fight for work is a is a good thing okay so creating vision for companies um, three years ago I left the company that I was with and we a couple of us relaunched a, a company that was um, basically in the red it was about to close the doors it was a perfect opportunity to really just try and relaunch it, rebrand it, um, add services, and see what we could do with it. It was almost like our own little case study for as a, as a company. And so I want to talk about some keys to success. If you're going to create a company, uh, or even if you're working for an existing one, what are some ways, some things that you can do? Um, one of the things is we came up with a purpose. This isn't, uh, you, well, let me read it. To improve the communities in which we live, work, and play by utilizing our collaborative expertise and unique ability to see value in spaces and places and our vision for making them special. So there's nothing in there about um, we're going to make a lot of money, we're going to make our clients a lot of money. Um, this is, to us, what drove everything that we did. It was our purpose as a company in how we wanted to operate, um, how we wanted to do things, how we wanted to design things, how we were going to treat our clients. And it's, now, don't get me wrong, the goal of every business is to make money. You have to make money to stay in business. But that's not your, that's not your purpose. You have to have that, what, I mean, what drives you? What is it, if you're going to create a company, what's your passion? I mean, my buddy Derek, you know, he's got an eight to five job as a mechanical engineer, but after hours, he has a woodworking business. He does, you know, anything and everything out of raw pieces of wood. And he does a fantastic job with it. And he's, you know, he's trying to come up with um, his vision. And he's got his, uh, what he's trying to tell his potential customers about what he does and why he does it. Um, and he's trying to build that up so maybe he can get rid of the eight to five job and do what he's passionate about on a full-time basis. It's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to build and it takes time. But you know, he's got that, that purpose too. I mean, I like working with this stuff. I want to do really cool things with it. One of the other things that we do is we said, what are our core values as a company? What are, the, what are the values that we're going to have that we're going to operate under? And we came up with transparency was one. And transparency is basically saying, we are going to be 100% open and honest with the client. If we can save them money, we're going to save them money. Um, if there's something that we think could cause a problem in the permitting process, we're not going to hide that from them. We're going to tell them about it up front. And then we're probably going to tell them what it's going to cost if that occurs. So they have an idea. We're, so that, okay, if we end up having to do maybe a change order, they at least knew 
that it was potentially coming, they could budget for it, and you know what it was going to cost if it did in fact happen. So we're trying to be you know as open as we can, and in telling them here's how we operate, here's what we do, here's the things that we foresee maybe are coming up, um, as opposed to trying to hide it all and then throwing change orders at them later, which ticks them off, and then they don't want to use you again because they don't like. I mean, sh clients do not like change orders. Nobody likes change orders. Nobody likes for costs to go up. They like to know what is this going to cost me. Uh, and so we do. We would do proposals where we would put our all the things that we knew we had to do, and then we'd have a section of, you know, uh, either things that they may ask for, like enhanced services, or things that we potentially would see that could come up down the line and a price for that. And they respected that. I mean, a lot of them told us we had some of the most comprehensive proposals that they received which was good, because that's exactly what we were after. Um, creativity was one of our core values. And I, I think just about anybody in any business, any company, creativity is something that you have to have. Um, sustainability was key with us. You know, working on like the Conservation 2020 project was right up in line with our purpose and our core values. It was something that we really were passionate about. Um, uh, the company worked on uh, the sustainability assessment for Lee County, where we did in overall how is the county right now in its uh, in the area of sustainability what are the things that they have in place and then what are the things that they could be doing to make the county an even more uh, sustainable county um, so that was one of our core values and then client service I mean that should go without saying um, we we wanted to make sure our clients knew that um, while not every client can be your number one client, you have to treat every client like they are your number one client. You got to make them feel like their, you know, their project is your a number one project, and nothing else is is important. Nothing else is going to, you know, distract you from it. We all know that you know you're doing multiple projects and multiple clients, and and I think they they know that too. But they like to feel like they're a number one in your book, all of them. And it's hard to do, but um, you can manage it and make them all feel like you know, they're, they're their, uh, your, your top uh, priority. The other thing is if you're going to create a company, you've got to have a sustainable competitive advantage. And what I mean by this is we know that in engineering, uh, it's kind of commoditized. Okay, I can design a parking lot. The engineer down the road can design the parking lot. So what is it about working with my firm that differentiates me from the firm down the road? And in a service industry, uh, in professional services, that, that can be difficult to do because somebody could say, well, I can design the parking lot just as good as the competitor can. So we tried to make it all about the experience for the customer, how we interacted with them. You know, we were transparent. Uh, we did have a core value of sustainability. We did have um, customer service A number one on our list. And we made them feel that way. And so our sustainable competitive advantage was the experience they got when they hired us as experts and the relationship that we built, how well we worked together and collaborated and did the project. And they really appreciated that. And there's other industries and there's other products where that becomes, uh, where it's easier to kind of define that sustainable competitive advantage. Um, but if you can find it and you can latch onto it and you can differentiate yourself from everyone else out there, that's what you're really looking for. Telling a story. Um, Derek's got a great story about how he got interested in, in woodworking and why it's a passion of his. And um, you know, we tried to tell that story as well. Here's who we are, here's what we're about, here's what drives us. Um, so anything that it's everybody loves that human interest stuff. And any time that you can kind of Instead of giving somebody the technical details all the time, if you can just kind of drop back a little bit and think about how am I going to build this relationship with this client? You know, what are they really after? What are they really looking for? And how am I going to deliver it? Um, and I can tell a story to them about why I'm passionate about what I do and how it's going to benefit them. And we can talk the technical details later, but tell that story, hook them. I mean, really get them something that gets them fully engaged in what it is about you and what you're doing, and go from there. And usually, if you can hook them, then you can talk the technical stuff later. Building your brand. Um, what is your brand? Uh, what does your logo say about your company? Uh, what, uh, what 
the way you present yourself. Do you go to conferences? Do you present, give presentations to things? Do you get involved in the community? Um, how are you out there building your brand? And I can tell you that when you're in a small business, and especially in a down economy like this, and you've, maybe you have some free time, fill that free time with something. Get out in the community, do some marketing efforts, and anytime you can do it for free, hey, that's the best thing that you can do. And that's what getting involved in the community did for us was it didn't cost us any money. We had some extra time anyway. And it was part of our mission to get out and have that impact and make the world a better place. That was part of what we wanted to do anyway. But it also got some uh, recognition, some name recognition out there. OK, here's these guys. They're out. They're helping out. Um, maybe now when we get a project, we should look into using them because they are so involved in the community. And they've gotten some awards, and they've gotten some recognition for that. Get involved in the community. I think I can skip that one. We just talked about it. Um, and sharing knowledge and info. I was at, uh, last week, um, I was at a business development retreat for the company that I'm going to be starting with in January. And we had um, a couple of clients come in and sit down, and, and we asked them questions. Um, and we said, you know, you probably get a lot of cold calls. You guys are a big company. You got people cold calling you. You know, what is it that we can do better when we call you that you'll actually listen to us or take the call? And, you know, they basically said, if you are calling us and you have some knowledge to share with us, some information to share with us, maybe it's a project. We're a contractor and there's a project coming down the line and you're letting us know about it ahead of time, so maybe we can preposition for it. Or maybe we're a developer and you, you saw this great piece of land or some building that could be renovated. Um, but any time that you can, instead of just calling and saying, hey, I want to have lunch with you and tell you about you know, our services and how maybe we can work together, OK, they're going to say, all right, that's fine. I've got a group of consultants that I already use. But you call them up and say, hey, I've got some information. Um, or I just went to this conference. And you know, this last project we worked on, we were talking about this. It was really interesting to me. So I went to a conference. I actually learned a little bit about it. Do you want to get together for coffee? And we'll just, um, let's just sit down. And I'll share with you the information that I learned. They love that stuff. Anytime you can do that, I mean, that's the best way to build that personal relationship with your clients, build your brand, get out there. Um, just that was the, and that was it was really interesting because we had different speakers each day, and each one essentially said the same thing: "Come in and, and tell me how what you know, and I'll tell you what I know, and how can we use that together and both be successful moving forward." And I thought that was really I mean, I hadn't I kind of hadn't thought about that because I had been used to maybe just calling and trying to get in front of somebody just to get in the door and let them know, "Hey, here's who I am and what I do," and really it turned into coming in the door and telling them what I knew and how it benefited them and then how we could work together and move forward. OK, so now let's talk about creating a vision for your career and your life. Um, so appropriately titled, Who Moved My Cheese? Because things in life are always changing. The world's constantly changing. But what's your vision for your life? The question I ask when I go to middle schools and high schools, the first question I say to, to the students is, what impact do you want to have? What legacy do you want to leave behind? What do you want to do with your life that's going to benefit the rest of the world and make it, you feel like you're contributing something and doing something for the good of others? So is that vision in your head, I'm going to be a civil engineer? And I'm going to figure out a cheaper way to build a bridge that lasts twice as long. Um, am I going to be a biomedical engineer and try and figure out uh, better prosthetics? Or um, am I going to try and cure cancer? Um, am, I, am I an architect and I'm going to build a building that you, know, you can fly a plane into and it's not going to fall down? And we can save more people. I mean, what is it? What is, you know? and, and so that's the question that you guys need to ask yourselves. What impact do you want to have? What, what, um, what do you want to do? And you're all sitting here, and you're all here at Lawrence Tech, because you're you know, looking at a STEM-related field, something in engineering and architecture, and you want to have that impact. But in your head, what does it now look like? OK, so now you've kind of figured out the area you want to work in, but what now is the corporate culture you want to go work in? You know, what, do you, what do you expect the company that you're going to go work for? What are their core values going to be? How are they going to treat their clients? How do they treat their employees? Um, what kind of 
uh, uh, benefits are, are you looking for? Do you want a flexible work schedule? Because I can tell you there's engineering companies out there that are very rigid. They want you there at 8 until 5. And then there's some out there that, okay, if you need to come in at 9 and work till 6, you need to do a little bit of work from home. I mean, there's some flexibility there. So what are you interested in? What do you want? And that's part of that. What is your vision? Um, my mom showed me, actually. She found this drawing that I guess I did in uh, sixth grade. And we had, to, we had to take a turkey and, and dress the turkey up as what we thought we wanted to be and kind of draw something around it. And I drew mine as it was a... It was a, uh, he was in a suit, he had an orange hard hat on, and he was holding up blueprints of a building, and then I drew the building behind him. And uh, I went into civil engineering and architecture. At that time, I think I was leaning more towards architecture. But, I mean, even back then, here I am in sixth grade, and um, I was already thinking I want to be involved with buildings. And I had a love of Legos, and I was building cities with Legos, and my dad said, you should be a civil engineer, because they build cities. Okay, sounds good. So do you want to do, you know, do you want to be a surveyor and you want to work outside? Maybe do some surveying on the beach. It's kind of fun, a little sandy, but good times. Um, you know, do you want to be an architect? Do you want to be drawing something? Do you want to be designing something? Or do you want to be the CEO sitting at the head of the conference room table, you know, generating vision and strategy for a company and, and how you're going to push forward and, how you're going to handle yourselves and everything else. What's your vision? What do you want to do? And then, of course, we've talked about what impact do you want to have. So do you want to figure out how to build a better, better bridge? Do you want to figure out how to uh, have better stormwater treatment, make the water cleaner? Do you want to come up with really, really cool mixed-use 12-story projects for clients and then put them in a 3D rendering and have fly-throughs of them and everything else you can do these days with, uh, with BIM and Revit and all the other tech, great technology that we have available to us. I mean, is that, you know, what impact do you want to have? So, like I said, work is work. You've got to find your happy place. Um, for me, you know, I've, I have moved around a couple of times uh, because I've come up to things and, and points in my career where I didn't like where I was at and I wanted to make that change. And I can tell you as somebody who has managed people that if you are not happy at the company that we're both at, I would rather you look for another position and come to me and say, look, I found another opportunity. I'm sorry, I'm leaving. This, just, this place isn't, it isn't for me. It isn't what I envisioned. And I found something else. Hey, you know what? Great. I'm going to shake your hand and wish you well. Because if you're not happy, I have to work five times as hard to figure out what motivates you, why aren't you happy, why is your productivity slipping, you know, what is it that we're not doing, and I've, I've got to spend all this time worried about that instead of how we're moving forward as the company and being profitable and being better. So you know you're going to have 40 years, the next 40 years of your life as an architect or an engineer, you've got to do it in a place where you enjoy waking up and going to work every day. When you get to the point where you're not happy, going to work every day, it's time for a change. It really is. Because nobody benefits from you being constantly miserable. Change is inevitable. Like I said, when I started my career here in Michigan, I left uh, Lawrence Tech with my degree. I started working at Noack and Frouss in Pontiac uh, as a project, assistant project engineer, I think I was called. Um, the engineer I was working under started teaching me, mentoring me. I started learning things. Um, I was actually interested in going back and getting a surveying degree. I actually started a couple classes through Michigan Tech, and I was going to get that dual license because I figured that was going to be a good meal ticket for me here in Michigan. Um, but uh, one of my friends moved to Florida and found this company in Florida, and he's like, hey, you should come check this out. Oh, I don't know. And so I flew down there, and I checked it out, and I liked they were more progressive. Um, and I came back and I asked the company I was at some very pointed questions about my ability to grow and move move up and you know it was it was kind of well it's based on your age and how much time you've got with the company and I and I thought to myself well then why am I putting in all this effort if I'm really it's the benefit to me is just going to be well eventually down the line you know we'll make you an associate and then you'll be a part owner and everything else and so in 2005 I I went to Florida and worked for Johnson Engineering and we had some great times we did some great projects I worked there for about four years um, but the economy tanked. We had a bunch of layoffs. 
which were hard. Uh, saw a lot of good people go. Um, but after the economy got bad and things got tough, uh, they didn't seem to have a direction for where they wanted to go from that point forward. And that really bothered me because I thought, okay, what, you know, we, we were in, in the younger generation, we were thinking of innovative ways to drive more uh, work in the door and, and go out and get clients. Uh, but they didn't seem to be interested in that. And so I said, well, okay, well, if we're not going to come up with a plan to move forward, then now it's again time for me to find something else. And so we created Ensight back in um, 09. And we said, okay, we've seen a lot of us had worked at bigger firms in different areas of the country. We said, we're going to take all that, the best of all that, and we're going to put it together. And we're going to create our own company with the values and, and the purpose and how we're going to treat our clients and everything else. And I have to tell you, being a small business owner um, in the worst recession we've had in a long time was difficult. I mean, it really was. Um, trying to get work and trying to convince clients to use you is 100 times harder than actually doing the design. You have the technical background. You can do the design. That's actually not the hardest part of your job. The hardest part of your job is having the ability to actually have work come in the door and do the design in the first place. And business development, marketing, getting clients is so much harder than actually doing the work once you have it. So much harder. And if you have that knack, that personality, where you listen to your clients, promise them that you're going to deliver on their vision, actually meet their vision, give them what they're looking for, goes a long way. You build those relationships. And then they tell their friends about the experience they had with you. Um, so, you know, we, we, it was a roller coaster ride for three years. It really was. A lot of ups and downs. Uh, we put a lot of effort and a lot of work into it. Um, but during this time, I went and got my MBA. It was something I knew I was always going to get. Because for me, civil engineering was the start, but it wasn't going to be the end. My vision was I wanted to own a business or I wanted to run a business. I wanted to be in management. Um, and I knew at some point I wasn't going to want to do a lot of engineering anymore. And so I went, I got my MBA, and it really opened my eyes to the more global perspective on things. Um, I mean, like I you know, we went to Prague, which was just incredible. And any of you that are architecture students, I mean, half of my pictures are of buildings, and I'm not even an architect. You guys were going crazy there. Um, I mean, it's just, just fantastic. And just to see how different cultures operate and how they do business. Um, and then just the people that I was working, it wasn't even so much the classes or the professors, but the people that I had. I mean, on my team, I had the director of tax for Walt Disney. Um, I had somebody from CSX. I had a research scientist, PhD, from Coca-Cola. Uh, I had a guy who worked in um, setting up electronic record keepings, record keeping and IT for, for hospitals. And I had a, a, a sales manager for John Mansville Ruffin. And they all worked on a more global scale. And I, I, it really kind of intrigued me. Um, and so now I have found this opportunity in Charlotte, North Carolina, with a company called Little Diversified Architectural Consulting. And I'm starting there in January, and my new position is going to be the National Director of Engineering. And my, the goal of my position is going to be to set the vision for the engineering studios and the plan for how we're going to meet that vision and rekindle relationships internally with all the architects because they're, like I said, they're, they're a full-service firm. Um, and then start trying to drive in work, not just from the internal architects, from, but from outside the office. And then they have four other offices in the US, and they just opened a joint venture in China. And part of my long-term goals will be building engineering teams in those outer offices. And a lot of that, that interest came from getting the MBA done and seeing that I really wanted to move more into the management of things and less of the engineering. So that's been my vision and, and my journey. Um, and that's how I've progressed. And I share all that with you to, to give you guys some thoughts about where do you want to go? What are you interested in doing? And what's your roadmap to get there? So a couple final tips. How do I survive the real world so you don't pull out all your hair and end up looking like me? Life is all about relationships. I think that's been an overriding theme. I think you guys know that. You've got your friendships, um, building the relationships. Um, I hate to tell you this, but um, you know, you hate to say it's 
it's not always about who you know, but sometimes getting a job, um, whether an employment opportunity or a job from a new client, sometimes comes down to do you have that relationship? Do you have that personal relationship? You know, five or six years ago, I went to a conference and they talked about client touches. That in order for a client to really get to know you, you needed to have seven client touches, whether it was an email, sending them a, a note, uh, calling them on the phone, going to lunch. I've heard now that within the age of social media and digital media and, and all the noise that's out there that you have to cut through, that it's almost doubled. That it's somewhere between 12 to 14 client touches before they really know who you are and what you're about and what you bring to the table for them. So life really is all about relationships. Communication, communication, communication. I still remember, and I know Derek remembers this well too, Miss Stavish, technical and professional communication, um, writing a resume and a cover letter, writing a, a technical report, doing a presentation, and then we came up with a instruction manual, right? How to plant tulips, was that ours? Yeah, it's something as simple as that. But I, got, I can't tell you how much I got out of that class. And I've told people, in, the, the students in the Intro to Engineering classes in Florida, anytime you get the opportunity to get more communication classes, presentations, writing, anything like that, when you go out and ask employers what they're looking for after your technical skills, it is communication. The ability to speak clearly, the ability to understand someone, read someone, be able to react to things correctly, uh, the knowledge that email is not meant for writing novels. If, um, if I have to scroll through on my smartphone and it's too long for my smartphone, it shouldn't have been in an email. If I can't read it in like 30 seconds, I don't want to read it. Pick up the phone. Come down the hallway. Come talk to me. We kind of lost a lot of the interpersonal uh, touches and interactions we have with each other because of digital media. And it is still so key in the AE world those those interactions um, I, you know you guys are like the most connected generation ever and the one coming after you will be even more connected than you are um, Twitter Facebook uh, you know these crazy websites that seem to change almost daily uh, all that stuff it's out there it's great and they're all tools in the toolbox to use but there is nothing that beats that interpersonal communication and being able to talk with somebody being a team player, we've talked about this already a couple times, the collaborative nature of what we do these days and being able to work with others, extremely important. Critical thinking and problem solving, I think that goes without saying for architects and engineers. Innovation and creativity, I think goes without saying. And got to have fun. So a couple of quick things that my MBA taught me. Um, tune in to WIIFM. And Mark said it earlier when he was talking about some of the changes that were made. What does WIIFM stand for? What's in it for me? And it's not what's in it for me, me. It's what's in it for my audience. What's in it for my client? The number one thing I learned in the MBA was put my, my mind in the shoes of whoever I'm talking to, whether it's a subconsultant, a client, a city reviewer who's looking at my plans, whatever that case may be. What's in it for them? And if you know your audience and you know what your audience wants, you're so much better at delivering it to them and figuring out how to get what you really want. When I deal with review engineers who are telling me that my design is wrong or maybe I forgot something or maybe I have an innovative way of doing something that's not technically within their guidelines, they don't really understand it, I go and I sit down with them and I don't yell at them or tell them, you know, I'm better than you, I know more than you. I sit down and I say, okay, I've got this problem and I'm trying to figure out how to solve it. And I've come up with some ideas and I wanted to just you know, bounce some things off you and I just want to talk with you and see if we can come up with something that you're happy with and I'm happy with. So again, we're starting with the collaborative nature. And then I try and get them to come up with the idea on their own and then I say, oh yeah, you know what, that sounds great. I think I can do it that way. And that really goes to framing reference points and nudging. Okay, how do I frame things? I could tell you um, a thousand people are about to die from a disease, but we've come up with a way to save some. Um, however, 50 people are going to end up dying anyway. And you're like, oh my God, 50 people are going to die. And then I say, do you know what? A thousand people are going to die from this disease. We can save 95% of them. 
wow, 95% of them, that's great. I said the exact same thing. I just said it differently. I framed it differently. I used a different reference point. You can use that to your ability to get a lot of things in life. A dollar is a dollar. So you know, our marketing professor said, um, you're at the store and you're about to buy a $50 toaster and somebody says, hey, that toaster's 40 bucks down the street. Hey, 40 bucks, all right, I'm gonna save 10 bucks. You're at Best Buy, you're buying a TV. It's $1,000 and somebody says, hey, you can buy it for 990 down the street. Eh, it's only 10 bucks. Wait a minute, $10 is $10, right? I mean, it's just the scale of it this increase, but it's really ten dollars is ten dollars. So one of the things that we got out of it was, hey, a dollar saved is a dollar saved, whether uh, no matter what it is. Um, don't get sued. I think that goes without saying. I had a, a, a law class, and that was pretty much the gist of a semester of law class. Don't get sued. Um, I never want to work in logistics or accounting. Okay, so and a couple of books. Since I've kind of talked about some overriding themes, some great books that I've read that I sometimes reread and kind of fit with some of the themes. Um, this is the age-old classic. If you've not read Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, get it. Get it on your, uh, on your iPad. Go you know, borrow it from the library, borrow it from a friend. I have reread that book two or three times. I mean, it was written back in the 20s or 30s. And they've done some updates to it, but the, the main messages remain the same. Great book for um, what we're talking about. And then this is kind of a new version of it. And we actually had to read this book for one of my MBA classes called Nudge. And it's all about setting reference points and framing things and how to get people to make the decisions you want them to make or the decisions they need to make without making them feel like you forced them into those decisions. How do you get them to come up with it on their own and make that decision? Great book. Um, Good to Great, Derek sent me this book after he finished it. Uh, I haven't quite finished it yet, but I'm getting there. Um, but very good book about, they, they all through statistics and analysis found like the 11 best companies ever and why they became the best companies ever. Great information in it. One thing that follows up to it, Mastering the Rockefeller Habits. Um, Mastering the Rockefeller Habits, Vern Harnish builds a lot off of what Jim Collins did in Good to Great and then um, talks about gazelles, growing firms. Firms that want to grow, I don't remember the exact number, it's something like 15 or 20% a year for say the next five years. You're looking at companies that want high growth. And so what are they taking that, that Jim Collins found and then how do you be a gazelle company and how do you push through with that, that growth? Um, and then the last one is titled a couple of my slides, Who Moved My Cheese? I read this before I got out of college. I recommend all of you read it as well. It's about life's changes and how to deal with them um, and, and how to help you kind of work through some of those changes that you're going to encounter. But these five books um, are not far from my reach and they've been a great help um, to me and so I'm sharing that with you. Uh, I would definitely try and read all or some of them uh, depending on what your interests are. So, with a degree from LTU, you too can have success. <laughs> success. And um, with that, I don't know how much time we have left for questions, but I will entertain any questions you guys have. Thank you, Jeff. Please feel free to ask any questions that, uh, throughout the presentation that may have cropped up. But Yes, yeah, some of it was the uh, from the engineers who were there. And, um, the question is, um, in transitioning from Michigan to Florida, the physical environment is a big difference. So how do you handle that? How do you learn? Um, we did, they did send us to some seminars. We had a lot of new people coming in. They were just looking for bodies from wherever they could get them because they were turning, they were actually turning away work at the time. I mean, it was crazy. Um, and so we had some seminars on, you know, permitting in Southwest Florida. Uh, I mean, the crazy thing was, you know, I went from up here, you know, you'd do a site in Auburn Hills, you'd have retaining walls, you have sanitary sewer that actually can get to flow through gravity. You go down to Cape Coral, Fort Myers, Florida, and the elevation is like eight feet above sea level. 
and you have force mains and water mains that run like above ground in some parts. Um, you have a totally different climate to deal with. Like I said, they have, it's a very subtropical climate. So we're dealing with six months out of the year where we get all of our rainfall and then nothing for the other six months. And so how do you design for that? And you know, the design storms that we used here in Michigan, throw those out the door if you go to Florida. I mean, the hydrographs are all completely different. The rainfall amounts are different. I mean, you're dealing with um, uh, some rainfall events you're designing for are like 10 inches of rainfall in a 24-hour period. And you guys are like, oh, God, 10 inches of rainfall in Detroit would be completely flooded. But you know, we could have a hurricane run roll through. And we had a couple of them, tropical storms, that dumped 10, 12 inches of rain in 24, 48 hours. How do you account for all that water? I mean, that's a lot of water. Um, so yeah, there's, there's mentoring going on. You've got other engineers who've been there, been there for a long time. They're teaching you what to do. They're sending you sometimes to seminars to learn what to do. Um, but I can tell you that engineering is engineering. You know, hydrographs are hydrographs. Storm calcs are storm calcs. You get the basics. You get the theory. Um, and you become that lifelong learner. And it doesn't take you long to pick up and and move ahead. And now I'm going to be up for you know a new set of challenges in North Carolina. That's going to be something that's different from either of the places that I've been. So looking forward to it, learning new things. What else? So uh, the theory and practice model of education, how has that helped you uh, learn from your education through your career? I think, you know, one of the things I learned most about Lawrence was we did do a lot of real world and hands-on type projects. That's one of the things that I don't think some engineering schools you get a lot of. You get a lot of time just sitting in front of lectures. And um, I really like, the thing I liked most was our, our senior design project. Uh, I mean, our group, we did, a, we designed an airport, a third airport in the Chicago area that at the time was being talked about. Um, and, you know, it took us through the whole thought process and everything else. I mean, it was a very real world application. And there was a lot of that when I was here. Um, and you've got a lot of professors who work in the industry and bring that into the classroom. And that's invaluable. I mean, really invaluable. Um, so it's, uh, I really, I think the model here works very well. I think it's allowed me to be extremely successful. Um, and I think it'll allow every one of you to be extremely successful as well. Done. So um, you know, a lot of people have a hard time with uh, direct communication, especially during bad news. Um, and so you know, a lot of times people might have a tendency to just fire off an email, by the way, I'm quitting. Um, you know, you, you, you've made it to four companies since leaving here. How did you deal with transitioning from one to another in terms of the people you left behind and maintaining those relationships? How did you break the news to these partners that were seeking other opportunities? When you're, um, when you're in bigger firms, it's a little bit easier, um, certainly. Because, and, and when you're not vested as an owner, it's easier because you're, you're an employee. And no offense to anybody, but everyone's replaceable. Um, that's something that I have found out that you, know, you think to yourself, oh, I'm going to leave, and I'm leaving them with this huge hole. But they fill that hole pretty quick, and they, everybody figures out a way to, to move on. Um, you know, the, the first two times, it was more. Uh, you know, I've, I've got this other opportunity. I don't feel like this is the right fit for me from a, just from a corporate culture perspective. And so I'm hopefully moving to something that I think is a better fit for me. Um, leaving a small business to go to this other opportunity that I'm about to was a much harder um, thing to deal with because you're in the trenches with people. You're, you're part owner of something. You've, you've built something up. Um, and it was probably, the, to date, the most difficult decision I've probably made in my life. Um, because I was really proud of what we built and what we had done. But by staying there, we would have continued to stay a small firm. And my, my aspirations became bigger, especially after the MBA and seeing what else was out there in that global perspective. So I had to sit them down. And it was not an easy conversation, but to say, you know, look, I've just, my, my goals for my life have changed. Uh, my perspective on things has changed. And I've got a different opportunity that I think is going to allow me to move in the direction I want to move. And, uh, and then you have to, and then the transitioning part is, you know, it's easy when you're in the small companies, in the small business world, um, transitioning is a lot harder because you have to 
kind of work yourself out of projects and um, the business components that you're dealing with. So it, it you know, it took about a month um, to fully transition out of things. Whereas before, I probably could have left that day and things would have been, you know, filled into place. Um, but delivering bad news is never something that's easy to do. Um, but I can tell you from experience, I had a project where I tried to solve something on my own that I probably had no business solving without some help, and it just escalated and got worse, um, as always seems to happen. And if I would have just gone to the engineer or you know brought it up that hey we got a problem we got to figure out how to fix this and get more heads thinking about the problem and how to solve it, we probably would have saved a lot more face and been better off. Um, I had to then go to the client and basically hat in hand say, I'm really sorry, I screwed up, um, and we're going to rectify the situation. And the company had to pay to fix some things that were designed wrong. Um, but you never want to, it's like you know the whole kicking the can down the curb, you never want to do that. You have bad news, you need to deliver it, you need to be honest and open about it, you need to do it as quickly as possible so that you can recover from it and move on. Your clients will respect you so much more for coming to them and saying, we screwed up, we found a problem, we're already working on fixing it, we'll keep you updated on how we're fixing it, I'm gonna give you daily updates, I'm gonna be you know, talking to you personally about it. Um, they really respect that. And a lot of times, you kind of work together and figure it out. Sometimes they don't ask you to chip in some dollars to try and fix the problem. Sometimes they're nice about it. That's why building a relationship with contractors is so key. Um, you don't want to go out with contractors with your whole mentality of, well, <clears throat> I got a college education, I know way more than you do. Um, so I'm going to tell you what to do. I go out to the contractors when there's a problem and I say, well, you know what, you've been out in the field for 20, 30 years. How do you propose we, we solve this? And chances are they've already got the solution in their mind. They know how to fix it. And as long as what they say doesn't, I don't have a problem with it, I'm like, yeah, sounds good, let's go. I mean, who am I going to, I'm not going to argue with the guy that's the one digging the trenches for 30 years. I haven't dug a trench, I don't know. I don't know how to deal with those kinds of issues. So I build that trust with them. They build the trust with me. I was talking to a colleague of mine yesterday, had lunch from, from NOAC, a friend of mine, and um, he was talking about how one of the uh, company leaders was concerned about the way he was talking on the phone and the language that he was using. And he said, well, did you know that I was talking to a contractor? Um, and I wasn't talking to a client. I wasn't talking to a CEO. Because if I go and I talk to a contractor like I would talk to the CEO of a company, I'm going to get laughed right off the job site. Um, just like if I go into a CEO and use a potty mouth like I would with a contractor, they're going to kick me out of their office. So again, knowing your audience, knowing their personalities, knowing how to interact with them is, is huge. And um, so understanding that uh, is a big key to continued success in your career. Question? Question. Is your careers uh, transitioned from more engineering oriented to business oriented? Do you notice the smooth transition? Or is it something it's just as the further you go along this path, the more you're learning? Well, you're, I mean, you're always learning. Um, the interesting thing for me was doing the MBA at the same time as owning a small business because I was immediately able to take stuff that I was learning in the MBA and apply it um, to the business. And so it was kind of like its own little case study for me. Um, but there, you know, there's, there's similarities between how you do things as an engineer and how you do things from a business perspective. And then, of course, there's other aspects that are you know, completely different. Um, but I have not found a difficult transition. But it's, I think part of it is because I want to grow from engineering into management. And that's my vision for me. May not be your vision, but you know maybe you want to you want to be an engineer. And you're always going to be an engineer. Um, you know, in the AE industry, the way you make the most money, there's two paths. You either get really good technically at what you do, and you have that value that no one else can provide, and you get paid really well for your technical abilities, or you try and get as close to the money as you can, and that means project management, interaction with the client, business ownership, the business side of things. So you really have kind of those two tracks. And either one can make you very successful and um, you know, very well off financially. Um, I've kind of chosen now to go on that, that financial path and, and um, management. Um, and it'll be interesting to see, because you know, this 
new position for me is going to have its own set of challenges. Um, and uh, there's going to be some things that I'm not used to handling. But, uh, you know, between Lawrence Tech and the MBA, I think I'll be, I've got at least enough background knowledge to, to help me out. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I mean, you're going to end up, you guys, as in your careers, because of everybody being very multifaceted um, and having to know a lot of different things, uh, you'll find yourselves probably dealing with a lot more of the business side of things than engineers did 30 years ago, even 20, 10 years ago. Um, just because you, know, you have a lot more of that collaborative nature, a um, lot more you know, small businesses out there um, and opportunities to do that. And, and really, you know, one of the things we talked about in the business development retreat last week was how do you get your employees to have more of an entrepreneurial way of thinking? And we brainstormed ideas because we know that the millennial generation is coming up and is very much in that mindset. And so how do you harness that in a company that is currently led by, say, baby boomers who don't have that same mindset? And how do you not stifle and make the people coming up, I mean, how do you give them that opportunity to feel like they are contributing and making a difference so that they don't go running off? We spent some considerable time about that. The thing that I like is that I think once you have that entrepreneurial spirit, that entrepreneurial nature, it doesn't matter where you are, what you're doing, you always have it. You're always thinking in that way, and it's always going to lead to good things. So one answer to that is hire more Lawrence Tech alums. Absolutely. And then the other two, I think we have a couple of faculty that come in and do a workshop for you on that entrepreneurial mindset. So, uh, one other question is, is what's the most difficult thing that you had to do with your partners uh, in, in, in negotiating or crafting who does what? Um, and uh, how did that come up? Well, you know, when we first started, we had to figure out, you know, we had um, planners, landscape architects, civil engineers. So that, you know, the, the technical side of things was pretty easy. But when it came to the business side of things, you know, who was going to take care of human resource type stuff and who's going to take care of financial type stuff? And being the only engineer at the time, it was, oh, well, you're an engineer. You're good with numbers. You can handle the finances. Oh, great. Okay. Um, but you know, we, we had to sit down and we had to think of what are all the different tasks from a business standpoint that have to be done. We had to deal with insurance. We have to deal with um, uh, the accountant and, and taxes. And we have to deal with the legal side of things, with agreements and contracts. And you know, so we had to basically lay it all out and then figure out who is going to take on those responsibilities. And then as I transitioned out, we had to sit down again and say, OK, here's all the stuff that are my tasks from a business standpoint who's going to take those things over. Um, so it's, you know, that's why I said what in, in my situation, it takes a longer time to back yourself out of um, that situation uh, than it would if you were, say, at a, you know, a more corporate um, level. Can you discuss, like, briefly about the global perspective on things nowadays? Um, I read an article, I think, about a week ago that was talking about seven, out of, out of, seven or eight out of every ten new skyscrapers are built in Asia. How, as a student, can you kind of get into that mindset of being a global person because of the different cultural barriers and different contexts of the culture? Well, I think, you know, one of the things we talked about, like social media and uh, the Internet and Google and everything else is, you know, you guys have a much more global perspective from way earlier on in life than, um, than people did. 30 years ago. And I think it's so, it is a lot easier to see things, not necessarily experience things. But you know, I, would, I would say if, if you get those opportunities to go on a you know, one week experience trip to Asia, because you're interested in how they're doing buildings in Asia, and there's, you know, Lawrence Tech offers an opportunity for, to send a group of students to something like that. I mean, jump at that. Take that opportunity. Um, I was a little worried when I went to the, the Czech Republic. I had never been over to Europe before. Um, so it was like, ooh, this is going to be something new and um, uh, different experience and different cultures. Uh, but, you know, when it comes down to it, people are people. Um, they have different ways of thinking about things or different ways of doing things. But we're all, you know, we're all humans. Um, but, uh, you know, it, Getting that, if any chance you get, if, especially if that's what you're interested in, I can tell you that we're definitely a global economy now. Um, we're probably not far from China overtaking the United States as the biggest economy in the world. And so we all in this room are going to have to deal with that fact. Um, 
and you know some people are going to probably spend some time trying to fight it and uh, instead of embracing it and we now know from this this global economy that we're building that you better start embracing these opportunities that are out there rather than trying to fight them uh, it's you know just like trying to convince somebody to use an alternate paving material because they used asphalt for the last 50 years and they just they had that mentality I don't want to change I don't want to change I know this I'm used to it that's all I want to do uh, and just trying to you know it's hard to break down that that door it really is but you know that it's a better solution and now you just have to figure out how do I nudge them into you know coming up with that decision so I mean globalization is going to be key regardless of what industry any of you guys are getting into um, and any chance you get to get some exposure to that, it's going to be great because you're going to, you will deal with it at some point, you know, in your careers. Do you guys look for that in, like, you said you're working in international engineering. Do you look for that in your engineers who have studied abroad, who have worked abroad? Well, the company I'm going to actually has, I, I was sitting at lunch um, bef in the airport leaving, and the guy next to me is from Ecuador. Um, and the guy across from me uh, came over from Cuba 30 years ago. And so there's a lot of um, people in the firm that have those different experiences. And so, yes, if you're, I mean, if you're going to go do work in China, uh, you better get yourself some people who um, are familiar with that culture, are from China. The person running the, the China joint venture is from China. Um, you know, her English is actually pretty good, uh, surprisingly good. Um, but, you know, she's, she's got that perspective over there. And so obviously if they're going to do this joint venture over in China, you're going to find somebody who knows the ins and outs of it and then be able to come back and teach you about it and the culture and so that when you go over there the first time, you don't make a fool out of yourself in doing things that are not the way they do it. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, if you're going to, you know, if you're going to work here in Detroit, Michigan and just do work in Detroit and work with firms from Detroit and really, you know, developers from Detroit and everything else, you, you may not get that exposure, you may not need that exposure, and, and a company here may not look for somebody with global experience, but if you're going to go to a larger company that's doing that already, yeah, then any time you can show them that you've got that experience, it's going to be a feather in your cap to try and, you know, get that job there. Well, great. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, visioning the future and, and creating it. Uh, the information that Jeff presented will be uh, posted on the website in, in a couple days. Uh, and uh, again, thank you for being here. Uh, we wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you. And if you haven't uh, signed a sheet over here for the Blue Devils Reward Program, please do so.